Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, Ali, are we re recording? I haven't seen that pop up yet. It's, it is saying and it's recording. Okay, great, thanks. So today's uh, session has attracted about 100 registered attendees, which is the highest of all the sessions we've hosted thus far in this uh, two-year Global Ocean Governance Lecture Series. So it's very encouraging to see diversity, equity, and inclusion issues attracting the attention that they deserve uh, with this uh, high level of interest. I'm Randall Abate, the Director of the Institute for Global Understanding at Monmouth, the IGU. And the IGU is proud to co-sponsor this uh, lecture series with Monmouth's uh, Urban Coast Institute. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the director of the Urban Coast Institute, Tony McDonald, to offer some brief welcoming remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Randy, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I, I really, I've been looking forward to this really remarkably. I would say that um, having worked in the ocean and coastal uh, space for about, uh, I won't tell you how many years, more than 25, less than 100, um, I really, this is an issue that uh, increasingly needs intentional and deliberate focus. This is something that in all aspects of my work, I'm realizing now is something that we need to elevate um, up front and center in our conversations. And it's a great pleasure to be here with some of these colleagues to learn what you're doing. I will say as a member of the National County of Science Ocean Studies Board, this is an issue that we are struggling with quite directly and trying to think about how to engage them around ocean science. We have a whole focus on resilience in New Jersey, as you might imagine. So the work regarding the disparate impacts on, on, on communities is just so critical to our thinking. Um, I am a close partner with NOAA on many projects uh, and a graduate of Middlebury College. So the Middlebury Institute has some, some relevance to me in a personal sense as well. But I really just wanna thank you all for the work that you do. And I'm going on a little bit longer to really emphasize how important I think this issue is and to us to build a community of professionals and communities that really are um, taking this on as a first level uh, area of focus. So uh, great to start off with this um, uh, this session and thank you to Professor Abate uh, for coordinating the discussion and organizing the panel. So I'm greatly looking forward to it and welcome virtually to Monmouth uh, University. Thank you very much, Tony, for those, uh, for those valuable words and I to uh, share your enthusiasm for this topic, it's certainly been an area of focus for, for me outside of the ocean space in environmental justice and climate justice. And I'm very excited to uh, dip my toes as it were into the ocean justice space. And, and this panel is going to be a great uh, uh, step forward in that uh, regard. Um, before we begin, I wanna mention that we uh, have our next uh, Global Ocean Governance uh, Lecture Series panel scheduled for April 6th. And that's going to be addressing some important um, uh, global ocean uh, governance issues regarding the 30 by 30 initiative. Um, so if you look in our chat, there is the, the link for that event page. And uh, please mark your calendars for that. We'd love to see you there as well. So I, I just want to briefly set some context for today's panel um, and, and note that uh, ocean justice uh, as a term is a... Uh, a conversation starter by, by definition. Uh, it's, it's certainly only recently started to gain traction as a field in its own right. Um, and the evolution of this field is so recent that what fits within its purview is still in the process of being determined, which is, which is very exciting for the, given the, the timing of today's panel. And we're, we're excited to, uh, to add to that uh, continuing conversation about what, what ocean justice is and can be as a, as a field. Um, and so as a starting point as well, the, uh, the ocean justice field traces its roots uh, to the environmental justice and climate justice movements in this country, uh, at least in part, and, uh, and overlaps with these two movements to a certain degree, uh, with its focus in uh, seeking to secure protections for disproportionately burdened and underrepresented communities. And uh, where it takes us from there in part is, uh, is what you're gonna be hearing about in today's uh, session. So I'm, I'm very excited that we have uh, three distinct perspectives on the ocean justice landscape uh, in, uh, reflected in the work of today's uh, distinguished speakers. And uh, 
and their impressive bios are uh, available in our um, event page for this event. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, I'm just dropping that in the chat for you now. Um, so without further ado, um, give you some housekeeping details. Each speaker will present for about 15 minutes, and then we will open it up for Q&A for about 30 minutes after the uh, final presentation. Uh, so we ask that you type your questions in the chat as they occur to you, and I will consult that list of questions um, in structuring the sequence of the Q&A dialogue um, at the end of the presentations. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Dr. Sharmini Pitter. Uh, she's the Assistant Director of the uh, uh, NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems. So um, Sharmini, the floor is yours. Thank you. As Professor Abate mentioned, I am the Assistant Director for the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems, or NOAA CCME. And this is a cooperative science center in partnership with the NOAA Educational Partnership Program with minority serving institutions under the NOAA Office of Education. The lead institution of this cooperative agreement is Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida. Our partner institutions are Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida on the East Coast, California State University, Monterey Bay on the West Coast, and along the Gulf Coast, Jackson State University of Jackson, Mississippi, Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, and the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And the purpose of this cooperative agreement is to educate, train, and graduate a new generation of scientists, particularly from historically underrepresented communities in NOAA mission aligned STEM disciplines and social sciences. And the original cooperative agreement between NOAA EPP, MSI, and Florida A&M University began in 2001. The program I'm highlighting today is the latest cooperative agreement which started in 2016. And since then, NOAA CCME has trained a total of 141 students, 55 bachelors, 43 masters, and 15 PhD students. Of those, 87% were from underrepresented communities. And NOAA CCME has since graduated a total of 62 students. Within um, NOAA CCME, the student and faculty research that is conducted falls under three concentrations or focal areas, coastal intelligence, coastal resilience, and place-based conservation. Within each of these areas, students are required to learn NOAA mission aligned co core competencies, which include social science core competencies as shown here. The students must uh, reach an introductory knowledge of each of these core competencies in their research. Additionally, for the graduate students, um, they're required to present information demonstrating their understanding of the human dimensions aspects or implications of their research. And they do this by presenting their proposed research to a group of NOAA CCME faculty, along with our Science Advisory Council and Community Stakeholder Advisory Board. And the members of these advisory groups also meet with the NOAA CCME faculty through the focal area committees every month to provide continued input for research development and also share additional student training and other collaborative opportunities. Today, I'd like to highlight two student projects that utilize the social science core competencies. The first is Sam Wenda for his master's thesis, Assessing Treatment, Wetland Efficacy, and Public Education in Stormwater Treatment Utilizing Native Wetland Plants. This research was conducted at Bethune-Cookman University 
and the focal area was coastal resilience. And as you can see, the two social science core competencies that he concentrated on were integrating models and practices and other decision-making tools for ecosystem-based management and advocating for accountability of social science in planning and budgeting to enhance coastal community projects. As part of this research, Sam conducted surveys of local residents and local government members to assess their understanding and concerns of wetland um, and stormwater runoff issues. He um, then created a treatment wetland to help reduce stormwater pollution and flooding. And this research has since been shared with many local government organizations, environmental organizations, and um, includes the city of South Daytona for planning purposes. It also included an education initiative to provide residents with guides for their own yard management. The second project was conducted by Anthony Lima for his master's thesis work, Interagency Cooperation, Policy and Management of the Gulf of Mexico Fishery. This was conducted at University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and the focal area was place-based conservation. In his research, um, Anthony mapped interorganizational fishery management networks and examined the extent of and effects of interorganizational trust. He also involved Gulf fishery stakeholders in the data collection process. And this research has since been published in the journal Sustainability and is contributing to a larger research endeavor to develop a toolkit for natural resource managers for management strategies to develop trust and collaboration and lower conflict among resource users. This research is being conduct continued by a current CCME scholar, Evelyn Ruzzi. And Anthony is currently at a doctoral program with our partners at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. The final example I'd like to share of our student training activities is the center-wide core competency course. All of our students, undergraduate and graduate, are required to complete a CWCC, as we call it, as part of their core competency training. The first part of the course consists of online course modules. The students have two months to complete the online modules which consist of instruction in NOAA mission aligned areas, including the NOAA CCME focal areas, social science integration, big data, and GIS. The online modules also prepare the students with background information for a case study at the field site for the second part of the course, which is a one week in-person intensive problem-based learning activity. The students are required to complete pre and post testing to assess their learning gains in each of these areas. And our NOAA CCME faculty work with NOAA subject matter experts and members of our community stakeholder advisory board and science council to develop the course curriculum and the course materials for both online and in-person instruction. And the principal goal of the course is to ensure students obtain knowledge of how to integrate natural and social sciences into solutions to real world problems associated with coastal communities and ecosystems. For the in-person portion of the course, students are split into stakeholder groups. Each student group completes a problem-based learning activity from the perspective of federal, state, or local government, local residents, business leaders, or environmental interest groups, which they develop through pre recorded stakeholder interviews and literature review. The course culminates in a mock town hall where each student stakeholder group represents their point of view for the proposed coastal development. And last year, our topic focused on coastal habitat restoration 
and took place at the Whitney Lab in Marine, Flo Marine Land, Florida, and was hosted by our partner, Bethune Cookman University. And in closing, I'd just like to share that we are hosting the 10th biennial NOAA EDP MSI Education and Science Forum from April 6th through 8th at Florida a &M University in Tallahassee, Florida, and it will be held in person. And this forum is open to anyone interested in the research conducted at the CSCs and NOAA. And I'll provide a link for that forum in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Germany, for those remarks. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, as a former member of the faculty at Florida A&M College of Law, I had the privilege of participating in that center-wide uh, core competency course, and I found it just incredibly valuable and, and memorable. Um, and uh, encourage those of you who have joined us today to, to reach out to uh, Sharmini for more information about it, uh, try to uh, find ways to replicate that, that concept uh, in your programs. Uh, I, I think it's really just uh, valuable on so many levels to, to have uh, that interaction uh, of interdisciplinary students and faculty working together to solve these problems in a fundamentally interdisciplinary space like, like coastal communities. Um, so our, uh, our next speaker is uh, also housed at a, a very dynamic place like, like Florida A&M and the NOAA partnership. Uh, uh, Jul Dr. Giuliano Khalil is uh, assistant director, uh, sorry, is a senior fellow at the Center for the Blue Economy and an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. And I just very recently, uh, uh, about a week ago, had the privilege of, of visiting Monterey to give a lecture and to, to network with the uh, um, Middlebury uh, Institute uh, faculty and students at this uh, Center for the Blue Economy, they're, they're doing fantastic cutting edge work there. And, uh, and um, uh, Giuliano is actually involved in some, some very uh, important and, and globally recognized work on, uh, on marine plastics pollution. So Giuliano, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rana. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share my slides. All right, great. I just want to uh, say, Sharmini, I really like the way you, you set up your focal areas, like the coastal intelligence, specifically in the place-based conservation. It's kind of refreshing terms there. Um, but I'm going to talk about this report that uh, we, we wrote, uh, I think it was last year that was um, published, uh, about the environmental justice impacts of marine litter with, with a focus on plastic pollution. Uh, just in a give a shout out to my co-authors, Marcy, Stephanie, and Christopher. They're really integral parts of the, uh, uh, the report, really like uh, important contributions to the work. So a lot of uh, reports uh, have coming out recently about this issue of plastic pollution. So we really wanted to uh, add a contribution from a different uh, angle here. So the, the goal is to really reframe the plastic pollution issue as a human rights problem, not just as a, a pollution management or you know, waste management, but really looking at how the, it's impacting you know, different populations in different ways and, and disproportionately impacting you know, um, low income communities, environmental justice communities. And uh, so the plastic pollution is, we all know it's ubiquitous right now. So plastic has been found at the top of the Everest to the bottom of the Mari Marianas Trench in the Arctic, Antarctica, every ocean basin. Uh, there was a study that found plastic, microplastics in rainwater in Colorado and then drinking water around the planet is contaminated with plastic. There's something recently, you know, uh, saying that we're most likely even inhaling, you know, microplastics particles uh, uh, at, at the moment. And then uh, in the oceans, it's a big problem too, because you know, like 11 million metric tons of plastics enter the ocean each year. Those are one of those huge numbers, really hard to even uh, grasp what they mean, right? And 80% of all marine debris is uh, uh, related to plastics. 
And then this uh, kind of staggering projections, right, that this number is going to double by 2030, triple by 2040, and quadruple by 2050, if we kind of maintain things the way they are today. And uh, this great report that uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with from Roland Geyer, uh, showing that less than 9% of all plastics ever produced were really recycled. And this was a... a Kind of an eye-opening uh, work for me as well. I live here in California. We have the blue bins and, and the whole recycling process. You know, you put things on the... And, and as I was writing this report, I got a, a memo from my uh, trash collecting company saying, hey, you can't recycle. There, there's something that we put in there. I was like, oh, you can't recycle that. I was like, oh my God. I was like, really? So it, it's a really complicated process. And even when you think you're recycling things, most likely they end up in, in a container and getting shipped offshore to some place right so and then as we're writing the report the pandemic hit and then we added uh this uh, a section about the impacts of the pandemic on on uh, the plastic you know pollution during the pandemic so there was a huge increase in plastic waste uh from medical mostly but also personal use and uh, during the pandemic we saw a collapse of already broken kind of recycling systems you know in the many uh, centers just outright closed for several months during the pandemic. So the plastic, the, all those materials that would normally flow there end up in the landfill. I think there was a report in, in the UK that more than 35% of all the recycling centers closed for several months uh, during the pandemic. Uh, many places, waste pickers were harassed by the police because they were locked down and they were trying to, you know, uh, make their living uh, during the, the, the lockdowns. And then there's this uh, the historical historically low oil prices that really drove the, the cost of virgin plastic down, right? So because of the demand for transportation uh, kind of dropped, the plastic the, the the industry like focused on producing more plastic, and virgin plastic became way cheaper than recycling uh, recyclables during the pandemic. And then uh, just some numbers that we ran across. So there was one single country that ordered 2 billion gloves uh, um, in April of 2020. And it's estimated about 25,000 plus tons of the, this pandemic related plastics ended up in the oceans. And more recently, this is the link here at the bottom of the screen that there's uh, 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 all this waste now is getting, most of it is getting incinerated, which causes a lot of other health issues related to air quality and pollution. So, and then when we look into the next uh, few years that are, you know, uh, coming up, it's, it's estimated that by 2050, roughly 20% of all oil produced will be used for plastic. And I, I think the, the, the plastics industry, they're kind of seeing the writing on the wall that, you know, as we move towards renewable and you know, the, the demand for oil for transportation is reduced, there's going to be a push for you know uh, produce more plastics, and that's I think what's driving the increase. And the plastics, you know, they have a, 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 a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2020, about 232 million tons of CO2 equivalents were em emitted by plastics-related processes. That's just to put it in perspective, the equivalent to, of over 115 uh, average size coal plants. And if we pick up, it will continue at this space and we're likely to, this uh, plastic related emissions will outpace, you know, coal emissions in the US by 2030. And then during the report, and then I know this first part, uh, I just want to acknowledge here that it's a little rough. I mean, there's not, but there are some good uh, news at the end, I promise. So the, there's some slides talking about some policies and some things that are coming up that will help with the issue. but. Um, Hang with me, uh, hang there with me for, for a few more minutes. Uh, so we looked at the kind of life cycle of plastic production from extraction to production, transportation, the use of plastic products to the waste of this and disposal of these issues. And then we looked at how each one of these uh, steps and phases really impacts vulnerable populations disproportionately, right? So environmental justice and frontline communities are often living near offshore drilling ports, refineries, and other industrialized areas. Uh, during the production, production facilities are often co-located with extraction sites or very close to the refineries. And, and during the process, you know, those populations are exposed from emissions from these plants and warehouses and also heavy traffic from trucks that are uh, 
uh, transporting the materials. And then during the use, right, corporations are really pushing for uh, plastic products. And then we saw many examples of dollar stores and very low income communities with very low quality products. So you use it once, twice, it breaks down and it ends up, you know, in the landfill or uh, in the trash. We, we came across this interesting report in Mexico, from Mexico, too, where uh, there was a professor that found out that there was a city that most of the water consumption uh, kind of a village is from plastic water bottles. And then uh, they rely that on so much and it's such a, a common thing that the government kind of decided, well, we don't really need to improve the infrastructure to provide uh, drinking water because the, the plastic bottles, like water is so cheap. So there's even, it's going to that level where it's impacting some of the kind of decisions from some, kind, some uh, governments on infrastructure and then the part that really gets most of the attention lately is like the, on the waste so disposal incinerations and you know landfills are usually located near low income areas and incinerators as well so that exposes the communities to air water soil pollution and, and, and other issues so the, the other thing we we did was we looked at how plastic pollution could impact you know the achievement of sustainable development goals and there's a, a, a great table on the report that explains a little bit on how uh, they are impacted, but we found that virtually all of them are in, you know, could are being delayed by plastic pollution, from you know, no poverty to to you know, uh, sustainable cities, communities, life below water, climate action, and all these other things. So it's a very uh, serious uh, impact on the, the, the sustainable development goals. And then, of course, the environmental justice impacts are very clear. So there's a disproportionate impact to low income communities of color. And then we found that as one example of many is that people living within three miles of some petrochemical clusters, they earn about a third uh, less than the average US household, but they're two thirds more likely to be people of color. So it's a very, uh, there's a very strong uh, and clear relation there. And we ended the report with some recommendations. Uh, we really need to change policy at all levels, from international to you know, local. Uh, we, at the time, we couldn't uh, uh, keep the language uh, asking for an international legally binding agreement in this report because there were some other negotiations going on. But finally, and then I'll, I'll show you some news from last week where there was a, a preliminary agreement that. Uh, uh, was approved by the UN, kind of building the groundwork for that, which was fantastic. Uh, a big recommendation is really to look at the extended producer responsibility, it's really to share the burden a little bit, because if you're producing 8 billion bottles of, uh, you know, uh, soda in one year, every year, and then you have no responsibility of the, what ends up happening with that product, and then we think, oh, it's a consumer, and then we're going to recycle our way out of this, uh, there's strong evidence that that does, it's not going to work. We really need to promote this more circular economy. And it's really related, I think, with a, a, a poor design. I, I, I like to challenge every time I, I talk to someone in the industry, I like to challenge them, say, like, hey, you, you can do way better than this. You, you know, you don't need a, a, a this kind of sophisticated product, like a bottle, you use it once and you throw it away. I mean, there, there should be no need for that in, you know, 2022. We should be able to come up with better, more intelligent, uh, uh, to borrow a Charminist uh, term, uh, you know, intelligent de design and, and packaging uh, that could be upcycled, reused, et cetera. And outreach and education, that was, uh, there's another, and, and for each one of those, there were like a series of recommendations and the reports so I encourage you to, to take a look at that. And uh, of course, political pressure, because that's how, you know, changing a, a single policy would have a, a much bigger and immediate impact than, you know, spending, you know, lots of effort and money doing outreach and education and trying to change consumer behavior and some of these other issues that we think it's really hard to do, especially when there's no alternative. We found like in some uh, 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 countries where people rely on little sachets to buy soap to wash their dishes every day and their plastic sachets, but they can't afford like a bottle or, or, or a bigger container. So it's important to provide alternatives to, to some of those things. And then uh, there's some great policy changes uh, happening here in California. I'll just outline a couple here. There's this bill uh, prohibiting the, the 
symbol of recycle symbol. I, I shouldn't even say recycle because this symbol is kind of hijacked. It's really, you know, you look at a plastic product, it's got the, the, the arrows. It, 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 the industry designed this to show what kind of plastic product that is with the plastic that uh, forms that product, not really recycle. So this is changing now here, which is great. Uh, another big issue since uh, China banned the import of recyclables uh, and plastic in 2018, because a lot of it was contaminated, you know, other places like Malaysia, Singapore, and others are now taking in uh, those containers, but in most cases, they're not really recycled. We're seeing this uh, mounds and mounds of plastics on, on, on coastlines uh, appearing now. So in California, if you're going to recycle, if you're going to export them, you really need to certify that they will be really recycled, you can just assume. It. So there's uh, nearly $300 million uh, allocated to promote a circular economy. And there are many others. I just uh, I, wanna, I won't go through all of them. Uh, uh, one more here, just uh, policy changes here is uh, uh, Ocean Protection Council just uh, enacted a, a, like a couple of weeks ago the statewide microplastic strategies. So to, from things from monitoring to education and looking for new solutions to to tackle the issue. And there are many others. I'm just going to kind of show them here. I won't read this, but there's uh, great examples. There's a link here when you get, I think we're going to share the slides. You can click to the to look at some of the, uh, uh, in detail, some of the text. And, and this was the, the, the big news uh, recently where, you know, the uh, UN, there's this draft resolution that was uh, uh, approved to really uh, create an agreement. And, and, and they do say uh, it should be legally binding towards an international uh, instrument to manage, you know, uh, plastic waste uh, globally, which is uh, great. There was a link here to the text and I was just kind of going through uh, some of it. And one of the great things that I saw is that it, it really even talks about carbon plastic production, which I think it's it's going to be key here to, to solve the problem. There are some, some concerns. Uh, I was reading an analysis that, you know, uh, some of the plastic industry uh, uh, analysts were very happy with the way this was worded, so that you know uh, um, worries me a little bit. But I, I, just the fact that we're talking about it and, and, and this was approved, I think it's a big deal. And we do have uh, let's see how we're doing on time. I, I have a three-minute video that kind of tells the story of the of the report. So I think we should have some time to just watch this, but uh, I'll, I'll let it play. Plastic pollution poses a big problem, but not only to the environment. From source extraction to waste, the existence of plastics hinders the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, affecting natural resources and the health and rights of communities around the world. For example, this is Yvette. She lives in a fishing village near an estuary. Her family has always depended on the ocean and its resources, but recently, a plastic manufacturer has settled upstream. Pollution from the factory may cause flooding, impacts tourism and fisheries, contaminates seafood and water sources with microplastics, and overall has negative repercussions on human rights. Every step of plastic production, when unsupervised, can impact the health and human rights of communities like Yvette's, which lack the power to influence planning stages. Try to imagine the stress and anxiety the parents of these children suffer, being exposed to plastic-related toxics. These marginalized communities, living next to polluting industries, are more susceptible to inequalities. Health issues compound education disparities. Moreover, waste picking is considered a woman's job, even if their bodies are impacted disproportionately, further exposing girls like Yvette to sanitation issues. As fisheries are polluted, fishermen, like Yvette's father, are forced to take jobs in production, greatly impacting their health with highly toxic materials. At the same time, the lack of political will and financing delays the development of circular economies, recycling and collection infrastructures, and fails to properly address unemployment. Now, from an infrastructural standpoint, plastic is produced using highly contaminated methods. This commodifies natural resources for profit, 
and hinders the improvement of cleaner energies. Coupled with insufficient regulations and penalties, this hampers the development of sustainable communities, while complex recycling systems burden individual consumers and local authorities abdicate their responsibilities. From an ecologic standpoint, plastic production drives climate change through the emission of greenhouse gases, threatens marine wildlife and aggregates contaminants through bioaccumulation and ocean acidification. It also affects life on land, as most microplastics and plastic waste output remain on land. Industrialized countries ship their plastic waste to poorer nations, and facilities are built mostly in minority communities, like events, threatening strong institutions and undermining justice and stability. In all, plastic pollution prevents the reduction of inequalities. But there is a silver lining. We are presented with a chance to create equitable collaboration opportunities to address plastic pollution at the global scale, to help strengthen the voices from impacted countries and come up with real solutions. All right, so yeah, I think that was uh, my time. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to uh, some questions and conversation at the end. Thank you very much, Giuliano. That was very uh, thought provoking and the uh, questions are already coming in on the chat for from our first two uh, panelists presentations. So we're gonna have a lot to discuss um, at the end here. So uh, one thing I did wanna note as someone coming from primarily the climate change regulation space, the, the, the plastics issue is, is uh, really a potential win-win here if we can really gain some traction on the regulation of plastics. It's certainly a massive waste disposal problem for you know, terrestrial and, and marine contexts, but uh, you know, the slide that Giuliano shared with us about its contribution to the climate change problem uh, is, is quite daunting and uh, lawsuits are, are being filed under, under similar theories that have been brought regarding climate change. Um, so there's a series of lawsuits that have been brought against um, the fossil fuel industry for their contribution to climate adaptation costs in states and cities and counties across the nation. And that's on a public nuisance uh, and, and, and other legal theories. And now there's also suits against the plastic industry um, for, for similar uh, recovery and, and similar legal theories that you know they they too have contributed to a, a public nuisance that we're all bearing the, the costs of that they need to contribute to and relevant to this panel there's uh, disproportionately impacted uh, communities from from both industries that that absolutely need to be protected uh, so uh, our third and final panelist um, is dr Monica Barra, an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina School of the Earth, Ocean and Environment and Department of Anthropology. And uh, one thing I really enjoy about hosting these sessions is to uh, intersect with people that I might not otherwise encounter regularly. And, and uh, Monica's background as a cultural anthropologist working in the uh, coastal dimension of, of ocean justice is, uh, is, is really exciting to have her join us today. And, uh, and she's gonna share some, some interesting uh, case studies from her work and uh, pose some provocative questions to, uh, to kick off our Q&A. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me all right? All we good? Perfect. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this conversation today to discuss how we think about ocean justice and, and what that means, um, especially in the context of conducting research on global climate change and its impacts to oceans, coastlines, and the people whose lives and livelihoods are connected to these spaces. Uh, my comments today are really designed to just kind of open up a broader conversation about what a concept like ocean justice means in the context of research design and practice between scientists and coastal communities. And I think Sharmini and Juliana have already kind of gotten us on a good start to this um, already today. Uh, so, again, all right. Um, so I'd like to begin to kind of just say a bit about where I'm situated in this conversation. 
So as noted a minute ago, I'm a cultural anthropologist broadly interested in the relationship between the production of scientific knowledge and environmental inequalities. My primary methodologies are ethnographic and they also include research um, among scientists and communities of color who are drawn together by environmental change along the southern coastlines of the US. So for the past seven years, I've directed these interests towards understanding the ways coastal science and engineering intersect with the reproduction of racial and geographic inequalities in the context of South Louisiana's uh, quote unquote, losing a football field per hour uh, wetland loss crisis, as well as the state's unprecedented investments um, in the restoration of, of sinking coastal wetlands there, just so you kind of have a sense of where I'm thinking and speaking from here. Um, over the years, my work in Louisiana has led to several collaborative research projects aimed at bringing diverse coastal communities, including Black, Indigenous, and white working class fishing communities, together with coastal scientists in order to develop more democratic models for understanding the dynamics of wetland loss and ideas for coastal restoration that can really honor both scientific and traditional environmental expertise, as well as reflect the needs of coastal uh, communities. So the challenge of doing this kind of work, right, this kind of collaborative participatory science research is, is part of what the title of my presentation today alludes to, um, which is this kind of distinction between accounting for and incorporating the knowledge and values of frontline coastal communities living climate change on a day-to-day -day basis into scientific research, and then in turn developing scientific practices that enact accountability to these communities. I lean into this kind of turn of phrase um, as a way to highlight the differences between including diverse voices in scientific research and scientific research being able to enact a certain kind of responsibility to these communities. I really feel like accountability points us towards uh, what we might think of as questions more broadly of procedural justice, uh, and as well as the kind of power relations that are really implicated in environmental issues, which extends both from, you know, the existence of just the existence of disproportionate impacts uh, to even how we think about uh, designing research and in turn the ways research informs policy here. So what I really want to emphasize here is that accounting and accountability are not one in the same thing, um, yet many of the most sincere efforts to conduct inclusive and equitable coastal climate change research, um, aspirations kind of towards using science to move towards environmental or ocean justice, as we might think about it, often kind of conflate uh, the notion of accounting for disproportionate burdens placed upon politically or geographically marginalized communities with enacting a kind of justice for these, these communities. And, and I want us to kind of think carefully about these distinctions here. Um, and while certainly, you know, it might be the case in certain scenarios that it makes sense to account for and incorporate kind of local or traditional knowledge um, into scientific practice, I think more often than not, our efforts to integrate these things uh, into our scientific research on environmental change or even into practices of collaborative or citizen science that seek to give frontline communities a space at the table in the production of scientific work, often fall short of substantively shifting the orientation of science toward the, towards the values and needs, uh, and frankly, the knowledge of frontline communities. So in order to think through this a little bit more, I'll just kind of speak briefly about some research projects that I've worked on um, in Louisiana uh, to talk about this. So I'm gonna talk about this one participatory uh, restoration modeling project I worked on a couple years ago. Uh, so over the course of almost a year for this project, I co-convened a working group of coastal residents, fishermen, landowners, and small business owners from Southeast Louisiana, um, the area around Bre the Breton Sound Estuary, for those of you familiar uh, with Louisiana here. Um, I convened this group alongside a group of engineers and modelers, ecologists, and environmental scientists, with the goal of us working as a working group together um, towards creating a method for participatory modeling of wetland restoration projects and model scenario building. We had, uh, during our bi-monthly meetings, scientists and residents would share their ideas and methods for thinking through different kinds of nature-based wetland restoration projects and ideal ways of parameterizing uh, predictive models uh, in order to anticipate the potential effects um, of these kind of collectively imagined uh, restoration projects, right? So, so trying to kind of figure out ways to bring um, 
residents and kind of lay folk into the kind of space of how decision making, frankly, is really made around restoration in Louisiana. So through the creation of uh, collaborative projects and model design, um, this was certainly a central goal of the project, right? And I don't want to diminish that part of it. Um, but the broader goal of this project was also really to focus on confronting a longer history of uh, mistrust between coastal communities, scientists and state agencies that is largely centered around the design and implementation of, of coastal restoration projects in Louisiana. Tensions about the extent of meaningful inclusion and the sharing of decision-making power over what projects to build and how to operate them are really at the heart of, of really robust and ongoing, even to this day, disagreements between many coastal communities and state agencies about how best to confront the state's wetland land loss crisis. So it was against this backdrop that our project um, really wanted to see if we could actualize kinds of ways of, of sharing the power of knowledge production across disparately situated groups, right? So between coastal communities and coastal scientists in order to try and democratize, if you will, scientific practices in ways that could potentially be a model for how to approach coastal restoration science and policy design and theory um, in a matter that could be more accountable to the knowledge and needs of frontline communities, right? And again, in a way to actually kind of grapple with, with how to, to not shy away from the disagreements we kind of see in broader conversations around wetland loss and restoration in Louisiana, but to actually think about how the design of scientific research can maybe confront some of the problems that we would see kind of come up in public meetings time and time again. Although practices of collaboration in this project were relatively amicable in our working group, um, it was certainly a challenge to evaluate or measure the extent to which our participants felt that their participation in the group was distinctly uh, democratic or kind of doing justice to a variety of perspectives. Now, this is in part because, uh, you know, democratization in the context of our working group was not so much a particular output of the research process or of the research design, um, but more so about the process of how we did the research, right? So it was about how we make knowledge, not so much about what that knowledge or outcome might be, if that makes sense. Um, but as such, we kind of felt that a few characteristics of our study design enabled us to achieve uh, some form of democratizing our science in this project, right? And, and a few of these included, you know, first and foremost, prioritizing the incorporation of diverse environmental knowledge that wasn't necessarily circumscribed by discrete stakeholder groups, right? We really wanted everybody who participated in our group to come to the table kind of in their own kind of individual environmental experiences and knowledge. Um, the second thing I think we did particularly well was really this careful design of our collaboration tools and meeting formats. So part of this was, you know, how do we, how do we have a conversation about, you know, the technical aspects of, of computational modeling? Um, among different, you know, differently situated people and environmental experts that do not have backgrounds in environmental modeling. Um, so we were very intentional about how we tried to set up our discussions and interactions in that regard. And then finally, you know, I think one thing that was really important in this project was the collective peer review of our final um, results and published materials. So, you know, as we know, as, as academics and scientists, you know, peer review is a kind of key gatekeeping mechanism for what ideas get put out there in the world and what, what ideas do not. Um, and we felt it was really important to make sure that everyone in our working group, from the fishermen to the modelers, had a say in, um, in kind of how we were collecting and analyzing our final results and in turn presenting them. So given these, I think, successes to a certain extent of the project, um, we also felt that we encountered some serious shortcomings uh, in our hopes for democratizing the production of scientific knowledge in this, in this approach. And the first, I will say, was really kind of lapsing into this kind of community input style of resident scientist engagement, wherein collaborative knowledge production often fell into this kind of well-worn practice of scientists merely integrating resident inputs into their models as opposed to engaging with residents as, as genuine kind of collaborators that are engaged in creating new approaches to restoration modeling, right? Which, is, which were the kind of loftier goals, if you will, of the project. Um, further, you know, the working group was heavily constrained by the limitations uh, of the frameworks we were working in, which is really the limits of numerical modeling that, that, that are largely dictated um, by state agencies in Louisiana. 
So, you know, to kind of put this simply, everyone had to work within the confines of programs, modeling programs that were designed first and foremost to serve the priorities of the state, of the state restoration and protection authority. This offers little room for producing any kind of end product that deviates much from existing projects and plans that state agencies have already produced. So this was something that participants often pointed out during our meetings um, and would note things like, you know, well, how can we really produce anything in this working group that looks different than what the state is already doing if we're using the same models that they use, right? Won't we produce the same results? Um, and this was, I think, a very important part of, of the conversations we had in, in these meetings. Um, but I really think, you know, beyond just kind of making what seemed to be a rather kind of obvious point to a certain extent in our meetings, um, you know, these questions really reflected uh, our resident collaborators, um, you know, their real critical understanding of the technical, epistemological, and political challenges of trying to build more democratic and inclusive processes into systems that are in many ways already kind of a priori hierarchical, right? Again, the models are built to serve the state, not necessarily the knowledge and needs of coastal communities, right? So, so to me, I found it really fascinating that, that our participants pointed that out right away, right? And, and understood that any kind of meaningful shift of power has to also, has to look at the kind of multiple scales of, of the systems and ideas we're operating. Um, within. So this brings me back to around to kind of questions about the differences between accounting and accountability. So part of the series of roadblocks that our working group faced in our attempt to shift the culture of science towards empowering non-scientific community environmental knowledge and bringing that on par with scientific expertise were these real structural barriers, norms in scientific research practices, investments of state agencies in certain kinds of environmental knowledge, and a lack of a, of a clear avenue for non-scientific knowledge to have palpable leverage um, in shaping coastal science research and policy, right? This made it so that even our best attempts to hold science accountable to our resident collaborators were largely inadequate, I think, for empowering coastal communities. Now, as communities who have long advocated for environmental justice have often pointed out over the years, you know, approaches to community collaboration on pressing environmental issues oriented around the goal of remediating environmental and social injustice, injustices must think beyond mere inclusion, right? And instead critically assess the power dynamics of the production of scientific knowledge, right? In order to make concrete shifts towards integrating justice into environmental sciences, uh, and in turn, of course, to kind of confront the, the injustices that these communities face. Um, these goals, though admirable though, don't always manifest in confronting unequal power dynamics that are often the root uh, causes of the inequalities um, that efforts for diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, be they in the ocean, climate, or environmental science context, seek to really to grapple with. Um, you know, so with this in mind, I'll just I want to kind of offer a few thoughts here on how I've at least worked through this. Um, one of the ways I've come to think about how to continue to push for accountability and justice in collaborative research with coastal communities is to actively foreground questions of reciprocity and restitution in research frameworks, questions, and goals. And in this regard, you know, I understand reciprocity here um, to be a parallel concept to accountability and one that draws our attention more explicitly to the nature of relationships between groups and entities drawn together by particular environmental problems. So in particular, I like to think um, with Potawatomi scholars, Robin Kimmerer and Kyle White's understandings of reciprocity in environmental relations as practices of caring for and repairing broken or harmed social and ecological relationships at the same time. So, so writing from the perspective of indigenous environmental cosmologies, scholars like Robin Kimmerer suggest that establishing and maintaining relationships of things like interdependence, reciprocity and care between human and non-human worlds are inextricably linked to a community's capacity to foster and sustain self-determination and maintain cultural values alongside confronting environmental change, right? So that these things are intertwined. Such a vision of reciprocity as an ongoing framework for thinking through environmental harms in science that seek to remedy these injustices point to the ways that scientific fixes like wetland restoration 
are not only about acres of land lost or gained right in the context of my work, um, but just as much about cultivating cultural revitalization and empowerments for communities grappling with the consequences of environmental change uh, on a daily basis. Um, this leads, I suggest, to broader questions about how aspirations towards justice, environmental justice, climate justice, ocean justice, and scientific practice can really foreground restitution and empowerment for communities carrying the burdens of environmental and just inequalities. Restitution, I'd argue, you know, points us towards the things that have been lost or stolen and um, really the kind of mechanisms through which forms of recompense and reparation can be achieved, right? I think that's really what this phrase and this, this word in turn can mean. So for communities of color, this, this often, you know, becomes a question of how science can be enrolled in a process of enacting restitution for frontline communities who face environmental qualities because of the entwined forces of structural inequality and environmental degradation. So though these things are kind of daunting, I think, to confront, you know, Black and Indigenous communities have long historically demonstrated how ecologies of harm and risk are frequently repurposed by community members and elders into sites for overcoming the forces of structural inequalities. So things like looking at garden plots, innovative fishing and agricultural technologies, and traditional ecological knowledge and environmental practices have all been ways that marginalized communities have worked to meld environmental knowledge and practice into what we might call more liberatory practices that attempt to, to undermine structural inequalities, right, while also cultivating more sustainable relationships to the environment. So in this regard, I think, you know, looking critically at their practices of of kind of enrolling the environment, if you will, as an ally in asserting things like self-determination and justice, um, at least black ecological, or sorry, black and indigenous ecological practices can really teach us how things like environmental and ocean stewardship can become aligned with broader goals for achieving environmental uh, and social justice or what we think about as forms of restitution, right? So, so to me, this is really about how, how can these things not be held in separate realms, but how can one kind of feed into the other? Um, so just because I know I'm running out of time here, I wanna just wrap up here with a few questions that I would hope kind of lead us into, into a kind of thought provoking Q&A um, about Sharmini Giuliano's work, as well as some of the, the ideas I've kind of shared with you today. Um, the first is a question of how scientific practice and research can align itself with the broader goals of dismantling systemic inequalities in our societies. Second, how do we keep our research grounded in meaningful community engagement, right, when we aspire to do this kind of work? And third, you know, how do we mobilize the privileges and powers that we have as scientists and academics uh, to serve the needs of the communities um, experiencing the injustices we hope to overcome? So I hope some of this maybe inspires some thoughts and questions. Looking forward to our conversation. And I'll also note that I will drop some of my uh, references here into the chat um, to share with everyone. So with that, I will stop sharing and hand it back to our moderator. Thank you very much, Monica, for those very uh, interesting stories and provocative thoughts for us to, uh, to uh, kick off our, our Q&A. <clears throat> So uh, there are many questions in the chat. I, I think I'll, I'll start uh, with, with two questions for Monica and just remind all panelists to try to keep your answers brief so we can get to as many of these questions as we can. So uh, Monica, were uh, the communities that you worked with engaged from the very beginning of the project or at some point later in the process? And is this a barrier to true co-production? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And I do think that matters of kind of what, what point do you bring a community into these processes. For this particular research process, um, it was, it started off amongst the scientists, right, and myself, right. So we, they wanted to do some kind of uh, uh, collaborative work with coastal communities. They knew that they wanted it to be about nature-based restoration projects. So those inherently already kind of limited the scope of the kinds of questions or approaches we could take as a group. And I think that's important to really flag. Um, but, you know, so, so that was kind of put out first. 
from there, you know, once we started recruiting people to participate, I think things shifted a little bit. But um, but in general, I do think it is a, a barrier to co-production, right? Um, you know, we had particular funders who had particular goals, like we couldn't just produce any kind of research project. Um, you know, and I think that's a thing a lot of us kind of grapple with, right? Um, and it looks very different than something like a participatory um, action research, like PAR type work, maybe some of you are familiar with, which really starts from having a conversation with the community about what kind of research they need. So, you know, I think it's important to note those differences. Um, but yeah, I think it is a barrier to true co-production and true sharing of power to define the scope of research. Thank you for that response. The, uh, the second question from Monica is, did you train participants in no blame discussions or problem solving? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I know what no blame discussions means. Maybe you could tell me a little bit more about that. Um, but no, we didn't have any explicit training in terms of uh, how to problem solve as a group. Um, I guess I, I'm kind of curious like where those frameworks come from because I'm not particularly kind of familiar with that in terms of, of how to teach the folks in our group how to interact with each other. Um, we certainly had conversations about um, how best to kind of interact with each other, if that makes sense. Um, but there was no explicit training on, on how to speak to one another or, or to problem solve. Well, I, I share your um, interest in more information about the no blame discussions. Perhaps Lillian, who posed that question, can add a little more in the chat as we move through these other questions. Um, let's see. Um, so moving on to uh, Giuliano. Um, Most things I've read about EPR seem to be in Europe. Have there been recent advancements in EPR in the United States? Thank you to all the speakers for this informative discussion. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Most of it is, is happening in Europe. Uh, I am not super up to date on you know, the latest in the US, but as far as I know, it's been not, not as nearly as much as what's been done in Europe. I think California with you know, promoting this more circular economy will, will kind of uh, push for that, but it, at, at a federal level, I haven't uh, uh, read on the, the latest, but I, you know, I, I think that uh, Biden's agenda might include some of those things. I just don't have the time yet to go and comb through that, but I think that'd be a good place to start. Excellent. And, and one, one observation I, I would make uh, and, and invite uh, Germany's input on this, it, it just occurred to me that um, your um, CCME program sounds like it should also consider expanding into the communities where Monica's working. So do you have uh, any plans to, to expand the, the, the partners you're working with? Um, we are looking to expand. Um, we are rethinking who our community stakeholders may be. Um, moving forward, uh, NOAA is putting more emphasis on environmental justice, and um, we're also engaging with citizen science opportunities. Um, so taking a look at who those community stakeholders would be who would have input in our research is something that we're looking into. So there would be opportunities to expand those partnerships. That's great to hear, thank you. Um, this is something I've thought about through the pandemic uh, for, for Giuliano. Uh, what impact do you see from the COVID transition to single use cups versus bring your own at places like Starbucks? Do you think this can be reversed going forward? I think yes. I think that's more like a, a, a medical kind of uh, you know health uh, question that I'm no, not really qualified to answer. But I, I think that's an example of a design kind of problem, right? That can be solved. I think at least locally here we can already bring our own cups to some of the coffee shops. I think that you know some areas are opening it up. But it, it's like how can we uh, uh, deliver these products in a, a smarter way? And, and uh, so I, I, that's where I, I like to challenge my colleagues, you know, on, on the industry to really think through and come up, whoever comes up with, with that solution first will have a very big advantage, right? So 
I think there are even economic opportunities to solve some of these problems. And, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. I see a question here. Around, is it okay if I jump in uh, from Tony? On, yeah, well, there, there was actually one about your slides. If, if, if you can check back to this there, there was a question for you about the slides. What's the link to climate change and plastics? Yeah, from... I, 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 I posted that on the chat. Oh, it's okay. from, yeah, it's from an organization called Beyond Plastics um, based on uh, Bennington College in Vermont. Okay, great. I wanted to make sure you'd seen that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just scrolling through. I, I, I do see the, the ones from Tony. You're, you're looking at the, the view on the issues prospects question. Yes, yes. Okay. So just, uh, very quickly on the timeline. So it was, well, my view is like, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm more optimistic about the plastic uh, uh, kind of treaty than I am on a climate uh, agreement. I don't know what that, what that tells you. Uh, it's not a very low bar there, but uh, this uh, treaty where this uh, kind of the text of this re resolution was approved by 175 countries. So it was like unanimous, uh, which is like, we can't agree on anything today, but this is something that, you know, uh, uh, everyone seemed to agree on. And their timeline is the goal is to uh, kind of come up with the text for the final text by 2024. But I wouldn't, I don't know. It's just in, in, it'd be interesting to see, right? We've been talking, we had 26 conference of the parties already, you know, we've been talking about climate for, you know, 20 plus years. So well, who knows? But I think it's the fact that everyone agreed on talk, discuss some of these issues with some guidelines. I think it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing and it gives me some hope. Thank you. And the, um, another question for, for Monica, I, I, I did see Monica's, uh, comment in the chat about starting a reading list on citizen science and that's really good to hear and I know the Urban Coast Institute is actively involved in some citizen science initiatives so hopefully that'll be an opportunity for additional partnering um, but there's a question here uh, social science indigenous and local uh, knowledge and social equity impact need more respect current science e.g. models and management treat them either as constraints or other additional secondary information? How do we move that uh, front and center? Yeah, um, I'll say just real quickly, uh, Wendy, I emailed you some resources because my computer is not happy with me today and won't let me drop these things into the chat, um, but some kind of reading list on citizen science and other materials that maybe the audience would be interested in. So you can drop that into the chat. Um, so this question, I think, is a good one and a very is is the big one here, um, you know. And I, I don't kind of propose to have any kind of clear set uh, answers to this. Um, you know, I do think it's heartening to see the ways traditional environmental and and basically kind of non-Western scientific knowledge is being taken seriously and accounted for in a lot of projects. This happens actually a lot in Louisiana, um, which I think is a positive thing. But um, it often does not, it, it frankly just doesn't have the power to shape uh, decisions about, about how we kind of go about policy planning and investments in projects, right? To be quite honest, the state has funded, you know, TEK studies and shelved them. Like, and I'm sure anybody who's done this kind of work understands that. Um, you know, so that's why, at least for me, this question about, okay, we can kind of do an inventory of traditional knowledge, but I mean, does that equate with actually, you know, shifting how we go about doing science and, and, and science policy, like science and fund policy making in meaningful ways, right? And how do we track that? You know, so that's for me where the, where the question becomes, right? Um, because the, the thing is, you know, even in NSF proposals, you know, broader impact is not the same as uh, accountability, right? You know, so I think maybe for those of us invested in this, asking even in our own work, you know, how are we doing these things like to, you know, what, how do we define reciprocity in our engagements with, you know, indigenous or, you know, non-white communities in our work? How are we accounting? Like, how, how does it kind of really look like in our studies? I think is part of how we can maybe shift these things to the center, right? And actually kind of give them the same kind of power um, that more traditional science looks like, 
Um, but, but I do think it's important to remind ourselves that even in the kind of harvesting, if you will, of, of non-Western kind of knowledge, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we're ceding the, the, the power, I guess, that we have, right, as academics and as institutions um, to that knowledge, to let it lead and develop policy. So, so I think that's important for us to push in our work, if our work indeed isn't directly informing how climate change policies, ocean justice policies are being made. Thank you for that. Um, I see that we're running short on time. So I was wondering uh, the panel had answers for you based on, on what today. Hi, Randy, could you please repeat that? Sorry. Like, yeah, I, I was just wondering if, if the, the, any questions for each other based on what you heard from your each other's presentations. Uh, just a quick comment. One thing, uh, uh, Monica, is that uh, not not really a question, but just like to offer. There's some. Uh, I recently found out that there's a, in Mono County here in California, they're looking at bringing back cultural uh, burning practices from indigenous folks. So they're working together with some local tribes to develop a program on how to do that. So that's uh, I think that's one example that I've seen where I didn't study it in detail, but it looks like it was going in the right direction. So it might be just a, a reference that we can look at too. Sure see what we can learn from that process. Yeah, that's great to know. Um, you know, I do think the particular, you know, I think about the differences of like California versus South Louisiana in terms of, of you know, I mean, we, we have to be real about the political climates that these things Absolutely. are kind of happening under, but it's, it's good to have those examples. And I, I'll say just a quick note, more of like a comment and an appreciation for uh, Juliana and Charmin's work. You know, I think these are great examples of, of the kind of need to shift how we train ourselves and train our students in terms of centering questions around justice and equity, as well as kind of how we, you know, design research projects, right? You know, I, Giuliano in particular, I appreciated how you really kind of pointed out how questions around economic inequalities are, are linked to these questions of plastic pollution, right? That kind of multi-scalar thinking is so necessary, right? Um, I'm thinking through this one. So I appreciate y'all's work. Thank you. Thank you. Right back at you. It's great too. Uh, thank you. And um, I would just like to say these presentations have made me think about um, even if we're engaging um, interested stakeholders early in the process of scientific research that um, we may want to think about the types of questions that we're asking them and how we're engaging with them. So I think the work you're doing, Monica, is really interesting. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I, have, I have two very brief questions that we can conclude with. One I want to pose to uh, to Tony McDonald because it looks like this question came directly to me. I think it's an opportunity maybe to talk about what we're working on here in this space uh, moving forward. And the question is, does Mammoth have graduate programs in climate conservation, wetlands, et cetera? You're on mute, Tony. Nope, we don't have graduate programs on that, but I would say I am just incredibly excited by all this work because I'm going to take something from each of your presentations and try to incorporate it into the work we are doing in both coastal resilience and ocean management, um, as well as uh, taking Germany's work into the, the citizen science work and the work we're doing with our students. So this is just really very powerful for me. I wish we had graduate programs specifically addressed on this, but we don't currently. Thank you. And I'll also put in a quick plug for our colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Duckett, who has been coordinating an annual climate crisis teach-in here at Monmouth. It is uh, open to the, to the community and uh, it's really just a great interdisciplinary way for a campus to come together on all of the different disciplines that are impacted and are studying climate change and all its manifestations. So uh, it's, a, it's a really great model for, for campus engagement and outreach to uh, communities on, on those issues. Um, and then there was just a quick question. I think this is uh, for Monica. What is your experience in connecting climate justice with economic development and ecotourism and heritage tourism? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that I don't work too much on tourism. Um, although I, you know, I, I can kind of just speak to it from what I understand in that. Um, I think those can be potential kind of routes, I think, to to kind of bolstering kind of communities, kind of capacity to kind of, if you will kind of live environmental change and projects of sustainability on their own terms. Um, but I don't know if it's a kind of one size fits all type of solution um, to achieving kind of forms of justice, because I think even like Juliana, you know, in the video, thinking about like the transitions that fishermen have to make. Um, it really reminded me of a lot of the communities I worked with in Louisiana where, you know, it's odd, like as the fishing industry is transformed and as, you know, restoration projects tend to dramatically impact um, what commercial and subsistence fishing looks like in South Louisiana. Um, there's this kind of pitch of like retraining people and like, you know, developing like the tourism industry, you know, so like this can't, this is maybe no longer going to be a, a, an estuary that supports communities in traditional ways, but, you know, let's transition, you know, and I think there are ways to do that that can be more accountable to communities than other ways, right, but it's kind of like, what are the forces that are kind of coming together to force that transition, right, and, you know, and like oystermen transforming their boats into kind of like eco-tourism, which is happening a lot in Louisiana, like, I, I, I think it, it's okay, right? But I think that just can, it, it, there's not a one size fits all for that, right? And I think that's gonna maybe mean something very different, um, you know, for like for indigenous communities like who aren't, who maybe are not interested in being tour guides, right? <laughs> but still need to kind of make a living or kind of wanna figure out ways of living on the water. So I think if those things are developed in deep kind of conversation with communities, then it could look just, but I think the terms always have to come from those communities first and foremost, right? And not just be reduced to kind of economic metrics. So like if you make the same amount of money being a tour guide that you would as an oyster fisherman, then it's a wash. Like, I don't think that's that's enough because what it means to be an oyster fisherman means something very different um, than what it means to be a tour guide, if that makes sense. Yeah, and Randall, if I may add just very briefly to that, I think that, that that's right on. I, I think it's not going to be one size fits all, but one, I'd just like to make a plug here for, you know, nature-based uh, climate adaptation, right? We did a, I participated in three cost benefit analysis kind of studies. I wasn't the economist on those studies, but, you know, my colleagues at, at Middlebury did that part where we actually, you can see that if you restore the mangrove, that's the most cost effective uh, coastal adaptation that you can have and that will bring you know improved fisheries water filtration all these other benefits so it, it kind of contributes to the economic development and, and, and sustainability of those uh, local uh, uh, kind of you know folks that depend on that right and the other thing is just uh, uh, on the tourism side we haven't done that yet but i just had a, a conversation with the folks here at the city of santa cruz and there was a, a grant that they, they were awarded to look at the interconnections between uh, climate impacts and adaptation and tourism specifically uh, in town. So that uh, we don't even know when it's gonna start, but we know we're gonna be working on that for the next year or so. So more to come on that side. That's, that's great to hear. And uh, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So we are over our time and uh, just, Please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists. This has been a great discussion. This recording will be available on our Global Ocean Governance Series page uh, for your reference and to share with your colleagues and other interested parties. So thank you again for joining us and uh, hope to see you on April 6th for our 30 by 30 session uh, moderated by Tony McDonald. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.